those who give it. And what we've discovered in the context of neuroscience and social psychology and research in these fields is that compassion, it, you know, enhances thriving, resilience. It enhances uh, our immune function. It elevates our sense of moral identity. But also there's a, a third valence here that I think is very important. And that is those who witness compassion are morally elevated. Welcome to Point of Relation with Thomas Hubel, a podcast that illuminates the path to collective healing at the intersection of science and mysticism. This is the Point of Relation. The following interview was recorded during a previous Collective Trauma Summit, an online gathering convened annually by Thomas Hubel to share ideas and inspire action for healing. Roshi Juan Halifax, PhD, is a Buddhist teacher, Zen priest, anthropologist, author, and pioneer in the field of end of life care. She is founder, abbot, and head teacher of Upaya Zen Center in Santa Fe, New Mexico. She has taught on the subject of death and dying at many academic and medical institutions around the world. Much of her work has focused on engaged Buddhism where she's founded projects, including the project on being with dying, the Upaya Prison Project, the Pranjna Mountain Buddhist Order, and the Nomads Clinic in Nepal. Welcome back to the Collective Trauma Summit. My name is Thomas Hübel. I'm the convener of the summit. Um, and I have the great honor and pleasure to sit here with uh, Roshi Juan Halifax. So welcome, Roshi, and thank you for making it, given your situation at the moment. I'm very happy that you're here with us. Uh, I'm grateful. Yeah, I've heard that there are big fires in your area, and and I think that also is one of the subjects, you know, like the whole climate change collective trauma intersection, I think is something that... Uh, is is around your corner right now and and maybe maybe that leads us to the to the first exploration how does your own spiritual practice you know support your you you practice for many many years or decades and uh, how does it support you in moments like now when you're facing a situation like that maybe you can speak a bit to what grows in us if we have a committed long-term practice? Well, thank you. It's a wonderful question. Well, Thomas, I'm at the Prajna Mountain Forest Refuge, which is um, 3,000 meters in altitude up in a high uh, valley in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. And almost two months ago, uh, a fire began. Um, that fire actually was... Uh, initiated by a prescribed burn uh, set in place by the Forest Service. It's really shocking uh, what has happened. And I live part-time here in the mountains in a hermit's cabin and part-time at the Upaya Zen Center in Santa Fe. And um, our forests are now closed, but since uh, the valley where I live part-time, where I retreat part-time, uh, is you know in the middle of the national forest, we can actually enter the forest legally uh, to come to where where I live. In any case, um, your question is a is an interesting one because um, how we can face uh, the uh, vastness of destruction uh, with equanimity and concern. Now, I, I want to just say one of the issues that um, is very, very clear to me is that meditation practice can be an experience where we completely bypass the truth of suffering. And um, in our emphasis at Upaya, because our work is around social and environmental engagement, there's a big emphasis on motivation, on intention. And this is one of the pieces that I think is very important in terms of setting an internal field um, that is principled, that has a you know, strong moral orientation. Mm. And that is to say, we are not 
doing um, our practice as a self-improvement program, as a program to protect us from the ills of the world. Um, actually, what we're doing um, in the practice is creating the conditions where we are more resilient, have are more resourced, and have more capacity to actually face the truth of suffering and to have the kind of concern that initiates action in the world, compassionate action. And that's been um, my path since uh, the mid 60s. I turn 80 uh, oh, wow. next month. This has been you know, very much at the, the core of my life. And I think that one of the reasons why uh, this particular perspective has been so important for me, Thomas, is that uh, I was very ill as a child. I was paralyzed on my left side. Um, I was unable to see for two years. And um, uh, in that experience that's, that uh, happened when I was four, between the age of four and six, and what that experience did for me was instead of disabling me, um, it actually uh, was a teaching, if you will, in, in a way, an incredible gift. Because first of all, um, it allowed me to discover that I had an inner life. And um, uh, that inner life was uh, one that was uh, awakened that was very obvious to me as a child. And that also became, if you will, uh, the, the resource for the rest of my life to discover, you know, I had imagination, I had insight, I had discernment. I also uh, cared about the world. Mm -hmm. Now, the latter piece, Thomas, was very important because my family hired a woman to take care of me for uh, the period of my illness. And she was a black woman from originally from the Bahamas, whose family actually was originally from Africa, needless to say. Her mother had been a slave. Mm -hmm. And um, yet she had an extraordinary capacity for love and for joy. Mm -hmm. So I had the, the experience of um, receiving care. My parents were also very caring, but of receiving care in a, a joyful and unconditional way. And um, it was not only I who received the benefit of it in terms of, you know, being someone who was cared for and cared about, but I also uh, learned uh, as a child, that um, uh, this incredible woman named Lilla Robinson seemed to also derive joy in giving care. And, you know, that's a thread that is very uh, critical in our discussion. And that is that um, compassion benefits not only those who receive it, but compassion also benefits. Uh, those who give it. And what we've discovered in the context of neuroscience and social psychology and research in these fields is that compassion, in, you know, enhances thriving, resilience. It enhances uh, our immune function. It elevates our sense of moral identity. But also there's a, a third valence here that I think is very important. And that is those who witness compassion are morally elevated. Let me just say that um, uh, that theme uh, from my childhood on has been uh, a teacher for me. And how does it affect uh, my experience of the climate catastrophe we're in or what has happened in our country around the absence of gun control and these mass shootings and the incredible grief that people uh, are experiencing who have lost children or colleagues or medical professionals in, in relation to facing this pandemic where in our country over a million people have died mm. of COVID and the grief that's held and I will say, honestly, um, this uh, what practice is about 
is providing the resources that allow us to be with the truth of suffering as it is. What does practice do? It allows us to look deeply, to have this balance between equanimity and compassion in the relationship between these two processes. And also um, our concern, uh, which is coming out of the sensibility of interconnectedness or what Thich Nhat Hanh called interbeing, to have that sensibility of understanding I am part of this and I'm also part of the solution and may I engage. And this is, I think, one of the most important aspects of uh, what uh, a healing path in relation to trauma is pointing to. Mm. That uh, trauma is a kind of no exit feeling, that there's no possibility of getting out of this problem in time and space. But um, the transformation of trauma it, it, through uh, positive action, through compassionate action, I feel is um, something that is very important for us to understand at this time. Mm. That's very beautiful. Wow, you said so many, so many important things in one go. Like I want to come back to a few things that you said. Um, like I love how you spoke about compassion and that it's that it's going viral when we see compassion, then we give it and then we receive it. The win-win-win is beautiful. And um and you said at the beginning one thing that I want to connect to another question I have. So you said our spiritual practice can be a bypass or can be like deeply resourcing in life. And I would like you to maybe speak a little bit more to that. And also given that trauma is when we go through an overwhelming situation, we shut down a part of the pain in order to survive better. But trauma also means that I cannot be in the experience because it's too much. So the spiritual bypassing and not being able to be in the experience can have a marriage. But the, the healthy, the, the one that you described, spiritual practice, is exactly doing the opposite. It's resourcing us to come back here, like into the deep experience. And that's beautiful. And I would love you to share a little bit more about that. And maybe also in conjunction. So what I see often in for people in meditation practice is that they're that in the meditation, we touch back in on the absent parts of ourselves. So then meditation and absence in meditation can be linked for people. And it needs some skill to kind of integrate this into a deeper practice. So this, this, this whole area, I would love, whatever comes up in you when you hear me talk about, I'm curious you know, to hear your thoughts, uh, your experience also as a teacher, um, how, how that shows up in your work, this coming back into life and serving, you spoke some of it, and how it's not the bypass, but actually we integrate the absent parts of ourselves in meditation to become more present. Yeah, you've asked a lot of different questions. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll try to just... Just, just whatever, whatever you can yeah. get to, isn't <laughs> So I'm remembering a line from uh, Zen Master Kazan's Denkaroku, and it's a line that is uh, always uh, disturbing, not always, but mostly disturbing. People don't get it. And the line is, do not find fault with the present. That's a pretty radical thing to say, because, of course, you know, when I sit here and I look at the billowing smoke on the other side of the ridge, um, the present isn't pleasant. But what Kazan is saying is do not flee it, see it. Mm. And often us finding fault um, or us praising, if you will, is uh, this is how we flee it. And um, what practice is, you know, in the best of circumstances, allows us to do is to develop this quality of attentional balance that makes it possible for us to see things really clearly. Now, this is not enough, Thomas. I, I want to be uh, clear with you and, and those who are listening. 
attentional balance is absolutely in, an imperative because it allows for clear seeing, but also what is equally important is our motivation. And that's why I sort of quipped, uh, not, you know, meditation practice is not about a self-improvement program. Uh. It is actually, uh, it is a means for us to deconstruct the small self and to realize interbeing, to realize our, we're not, I'm not separate from that smoke billowing above the mountain ridge that I'm gazing at in this moment. And so, you know, to have the capacity to actually understand, number one, the deconstructed self, small self, allows us to actualize this sense of interconnectedness, interdependence, and interpenetration, or what Thich Nhat Hanh calls interbeing or pratichu samupada. It's, you know, to have that as a direct experience um, is really important, which is uh, in the right circumstance. Um, our motivation that has uh, altruism and compassion as its foundation makes that possible. Now, another thing that um, uh, is very helpful is to recognize the truth of impermanence. So, for example, you know, I mean, I am looking at this gray, uh, swirling smoke billowing into the brilliant New Mexico sky. And um, it makes me feel pretty awful on one side, uh, because that is what is happening uh, in the present moment. But also, Thomas, I've sat with dying people for decades. Uh, mm. The truth is, we're all mortal. Mm. Uh, these forests in you know, and the long body of, of the earth will one day come back, probably not in our lifetime because of the nature of uh, the climate situation. Um, but what one realizes in uh, deep states of practice is the uh, complete groundlessness and uh, transitoriness of our phenomenal experience. Not that I accept this as a good thing. I accept it as what is happening. And I also take responsibility and I will do my best without attachment to outcome. Mm -hmm. And this is the attitude that I brought uh, in working with dying people. Um, death was the inevitable outcome of every uh, interaction I had with the people I came alongside, and I still do that work. Mm -hmm. But I never did less than my best, if you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So sometimes my best was only this big, sometimes it was bigger, if you know what I'm saying. But in mm -hmm. any moment, you know, you there's this quality of wholeheartedness that you bring into uh, a, any given situation. Mm. Now, um, you, you asked a little bit, Thomas, about moral suffering, and there's something called moral residue, which is, you know, we bring our best into a good, given situation, but things don't always turn out so well. And um, moral residue, you know, this is the kind of stuff that's left over that uh, can be uh, uh, cumulative and can really um, uh, weigh us down. So part of you know, the work of practice um, is to come to a place where you recognize there's always going to be, if you will, a fly in the ointment or moral residue where things are not going to be perfect. And understand the gift of that, which is the this, this sense of humility. So I just want to mention that in all, because mm -hmm. a lot of times uh, we're looking for, for perfection. Mm -hmm. And um, life is not perfect. Life is just as it is. 
Yeah. And so it's that capacity to um, have the kind of openness that allows us to live um, with a little more uh, grace and humility as a result of uh, things are just the way they are. And no matter how hard we try, um, they don't always unfold in a way that feels right or aligned for us. Mm. Yeah, that's beautiful. Also, this being with life exactly as it is, like in this uh, meeting life where it is, it's a very beautiful quality of uh, the practice. And so when you said, just a short question circling back, when you said I'm, I was, I'm working with um, in hospice or in with dying uh, people, like, can you, can you say a little bit about what's that work about? So I think it's a, it's a very deep work and these are deep moments. Um, what's the work that you are doing there um, with people? So, you know, I, I, I really came to this work uh, in my uh, younger years um, as a result of the, the death of my grandmother, which was a very tough death. And I said to her, she was gone, but her body was there. Uh -huh. I, you know, I said, I, I want to make a difference in um, how people die in Western culture. And uh, I don't know if I've made any difference to, for anyone, but um, uh, I would say that my greatest teachers really have been dying people. Uh -huh. First of teaching me the truth of mortality, you know, we're all going to die. Uh -huh. And sitting with that, seeing how this person and that person met the dying experience and realizing um, it was their journey. And I was uh, privileged to come alongside him or her in this final uh, developmental phase of their life. Uh -huh. And as a result of um, that work, which first opened up for me when I was uh, a young medical anthropologist at the University of Miami School of Medicine, and recognize that the most marginalized people in that medical system, in fact, were dying people. So this was in 1970, it's a long mm -hmm. time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I married Stanislav Grof, the psychiatrist who uh, worked with LSD as an adjunct to psychotherapy and joined his project at the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center as a co-therapist with him. And then uh, doing this LSD-assisted psychotherapy with people dying of cancer, it was so powerful for me as uh, a person coming alongside someone dying of cancer who had um, uh, consented to uh, this kind of very powerful therapy that was a rite of passage. There more or less final rite of passage before they met death itself, the ultimate rite of passage. And to enter into that kind of intimacy, Thomas, with a dying person and to recognize that we had vastly underestimated the human unconscious as it was evoked uh, in the LSD experience. And to see that um, Often what happened was, in Stan's terms, you know, a reliving of the biological birth. In my terms as an anthropologist, going through a death and rebirth experience, which allowed people to um, revision uh, what it meant to be dying and uh, also to understand death um, as a radical transformation process. So it was so powerful and so awesome. And I, I will say parenthetically, um, to see this work uh, revived now, and I'm so happy Stan and I, though we're, we've been divorced for years, but he's alive to actually see the resurgence of this work. It's just amazing. I'm very happy for him, and I'm happy to see this work 
experience that dying people went through, including, you know, reliving um, uh, very traumatizing experiences from their past, but understanding uh, those difficult and, and terrifying experiences from a different point of view. And um, from the point of view that I have tried to share a li little bit in our conversation, which is she was seeing the perspective of uh, impermanence, understanding uh, the value of trauma in terms of post-traumatic growth. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I learned so much uh, in the course of that, um, uh, of those years of working with Stan and dying people. Stan and I went our separate ways, and I realized that dying itself um, involved deep transformations of consciousness. Mm -hmm. That for uh, uh, it wasn't always necessary to take 600 micrograms of acid. Uh, mm -hmm. That um, coming alongside an individual with this kind of not knowing, this openness, and uh, presencing. Um, uh, could provide the means for the kind of transformation that we saw in the LSD work. Mm. Yeah, I can feel the depth of, of the work that you did as you're sharing it, like as you're transmitting it here to us. And it's, it's beautiful. It's very deep. And, um, and, uh, so when you, um, Talk, when we come back a little bit to the moral injury, because like in trauma, you talked about reliving some of the trauma also in the process of dying. But when we when we look at we carry trauma inside, we our ancestors were traumatized, or the collectives went through like the Second World War or any kind of or racism and slavery. Um, so when we when we come to the to the moral recognition of whichever sides, maybe you can speak a little bit to how do we, how do we learn morally or ethically or our virtues, however we call it, how do we, how does that learning happen? So check souls. And I think you also speak about the moral injury that when we transgressed like kind of the fabric of life or the fabric of light, so then we, we feel it, we feel it as a distress inside, we feel it in, in many ways. So how can, like, how do you work also in your spiritual community or how do people work the restoration process or how can we restore our moral injuries back into like a recognition a restoration and a flourishing? Maybe you can speak a bit to that whole uh, yeah, part of our journey. So I think that, one of the ways, Thomas, is by recognizing um, what moral suffering is. And, um, you know, moral suffering is the anguish that we experience when we have been exposed to, through our own actions, or the actions of others, uh, uh, transgressiveness, uh, egregious harm. And um, I've identified uh, four different expressions of moral suffering, uh, each of which has its, its own flavor of, of anguish. And the first of these is moral distress. And um, uh, moral distress, Thomas, is that experience uh, of when um, we are confronted with a moral dilemma Let's say we're a clinician uh, taking care of someone who is dying of COVID, dying of this virus, and um, we are not able to bring the family into uh, the room of the patient because of hospital regulations and or into the ICU should the person be in the ICU. And we feel this, you know, profound, it's a moral dilemma. We want to do something, but the, the system says we can't. And we feel a deep moral conflict. Mm. And this is uh, moral distress arises because we know that if we bring uh, the patient's family in, 
to the bedside of the dying person, we will actually, you know, the person will benefit, the family will benefit, we'll feel better as a clinician. But um, we, we're not allowed to do that. And so th- we experience what is called moral distress. In other words, we see a pathway through, but we can't actually follow that pathway. And so uh, the patient dies, the family is in grief, and we ourselves experience moral distress. We feel that this could have gone down better. Mm-hmm. And so we can, you know, many I can you know, give you many examples of this. This is where, you know, you really feel the impact of moral residue. It's just, you feel bad. You feel um, your own sense of personal value and personal worth is, is deeply compromised or affected by this experience. So that's moral distress. Now, moral injury is a a second uh, aspect of moral suffering. And this is pervasive in the military, and it has been well documented in the military. I mean, during the war in Afghanistan and during the war in Iraq, um, you know, soldiers from our country, military people in our country, saw things that were horrible and did things that were horrible. And as a result of that, they felt deep shame. They felt uh, as though they were morally compromised. Whether they saw horrible things or did horrible things, the effect was very similar. It was the sense of moral decay. Mm -hmm. And the experience of moral injury um, uh, had the outcome of, uh, you know, really priming the suicide rate among uh, people in the military. Now, what is really tragic in our country, what we're discovering um, in terms of the experience of uh, many clinicians dealing with the pandemic is that they're experiencing as well moral injury. They feel that they've been asked to do things to their patients, which have been uh, violating, uh, non-beneficial for their patients. Mm -hmm. And it could even be as far as, um, uh, you know, intubating uh, their patient instead of actually providing a kind of context of care um, because the person would die, you know, but they were going to die anyway, but they were then put on machines and their lives were sustained. And you just, the doctors and the nurses who were engaged in doing that with so many deaths uh, as the outcome um, felt as though their own identity as um, a clinician was somehow compromised. And they felt, have felt really uh, the experience of moral injury. And, um, Uh, the suicide rate among clinicians in our country is not inconsequential. Uh Now, the third expression of moral suffering is of moral outrage. And um, I think we all know this, or many of us know this. This is the sense of uh, blaming the system or blaming people uh, for bad things that are happening in our society or environmentally. So moral outrage can initiate a good action, but also can become chronic. And so you know these kinds of people where their the sense of self-righteousness, you know, pervades their entire presence. And um, it becomes a kind of sickness, if you will. Uh-huh. And the fourth is moral apathy. And uh, this loops back, Thomas, to what you and I were speaking about in terms of bypass. That is that we are engaged in uh, actions or find ourselves in social contexts, uh, contexts of privilege, of separation, that do not allow us to actually be touched by the truth of the suffering uh, around us. And whether it's privilege, 
or addiction, alcohol, <laughs> drugs, sex, whatever, taking us away from the present moment, uh, whatever it is. And that experience of moral apathy, which is a term actually that um, was used by James Baldwin, uh, the great writer. Um, moral apathy, needless to say, leads to complete moral disengagement. Mm -hmm. And so these are, it, which is itself uh, a form of suffering. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the work I feel um, uh, that we must do, uh, one is to uh, look at trauma, not as a dead end, so to speak, like this is a, there's no way out in time and space, but to um, uh, emphasize um, the importance uh, of, if you will, this view from complex adaptive systems that say, you know, when a system breaks down and learns from its breakdown, um, and it can reorder itself at a higher and more robust level. Mm -hmm. So you think about someone like Malala, for example, shot in the head doing a good thing, an important thing. And instead of collapsing into a heap, you know, becoming a, a world figure around issues related to the education of girls, mm -hmm. you know, using something perceived experiences. Uh, you know, horrible trauma, but metabolizing it uh, into, you know, greater uh, robustness, you know, and in the experience of uh, post-traumatic growth. Mm -hmm. And so the, the real call, again, and why practice is important, is that it provides this powerful resource that enhances our capacity to look deeply and clearly. And to have a motivation, which is uh, compassionate and altruistic. And bringing these two features together, so we have the capacity to um, uh, resource ourselves to, to meet a world of suffering and not to be collapsed under the burden of suffering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful. Also, how you beautifully described the post-traumatic learning that when we really take it on, so then it makes us more robust, more resilient, and we can engage even more if we integrate the suffering. That's beautiful. You know, you're referring now to like a kind of a power to transform our trauma into resilience, which we call post-traumatic growth. And, and I... Uh, and I would love to explore what is um, that some people feel really weighed down by their trauma. And it seems like they don't have the power by themselves to come out of it. And then other people that are equally traumatized feel like there is a drive in them to take on that hurt or pain and transform it into learning. So that's one thing. And the other question I have is, what, how do you see the role of community? So why do we need community or do we need community? And if so, why to help us to do that together, to do that kind of healing and practice work together. So these two things, I'm, I'm interested how you look at this and what did, what does your experience show? So I think your question uh, about resilience is wonderful, Thomas, and also about community. But in your question about resilience, it's, uh, it's interesting because you're saying, you know, how is it that some people collapse and um, don't come out of that collapse as a result of uh, their encounter with uh, great difficulties and others uh, have the capacity to, to meet the world? And you know what? I cannot say. Mm -hmm. I really can't. I don't know. What um, uh, Malala, for example, uh, how she did it. Uh, Nelson Mandela, 41 years or so in Robin, the prison in Robin Island, and how he came out of uh, uh, prison as a peacemaker after being uh, subjected to so much, uh, so many humiliating and horrifying uh, experiences. I don't know. Mm. Or Jimmy Santiago Baca, the poet, uh, uh, after uh, 
being in solitary confinement, unable to read, teaching himself to, to read and being now, you know, one of New Mexico's great poets. I don't know. Mm. Oh, what, what, what makes that possible? Um, but I do want to say some things about resilience because I, I think that this is an area that is really important. And to talk about um, ways, briefly, uh, ways that uh, resilience is uh, enhanced or expresses itself. And um, one of these ways is that um, I feel that we need better stories. We need more imagination. Somehow when you think about Nelson Mandela and Robin Island, I think that maybe what got him through was his imagination. To imagine uh, a world um, that is not characterized by violence, though he was subjected to it. And he also participated in it. And so, you know, this is um, how we develop um, our ability to reframe difficult situations in a way that is fundamentally generative. And it takes imagination. And um, sometimes I feel that the hopelessness that is and futility that is being spread like a bad disease through our social media is um, robbing us of um, our uh, ability to vision or to imagine um, what it is to live in a, a world that is uh, thriving, a world that is sane. Mm. So the first thing is, is you know, our capacity to uh, reframe. Uh -huh. You know, another, um, which is something that comes uh, out of uh, the experience of practice um, uh, but uh, uh, also uh, my old friend, Richie Davidson, the neuroscientist, he, he talks about it in terms of uh, mental nimbleness or our capacity to be uh, uh, adaptable and to be flexible. Um, we're sometimes without imagination really stuck in our views. Mm -hmm. And so um, how we have this, uh, how important it is for us to actually be adaptable and flexible in relation to what is unfolding in the present moment. And that adaptivity, that capacity for adaptivity is very important. And it means that we're not stuck in fixed views. So that's, I, you know, the second thing I, I want to uh, mention um, uh, that uh, we we are able to be responsive to this moment as it is. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned community and um, uh, our ability to actually share positive emotions is, is critical with each other. You know, if you're just in sinking mind and spreading sinking mind, you know, if you're in the grip of futility, um, if your view of the world is uh, in a, of life, it's, well, we're all going to die. Um, instead of being able, and again, I think about Lala and Nelson Mandela, two remarkable people to actually um, uh, be able to find, if you will, the, the, the jewel or the generativity. Our resilience is really uh, deeply enhanced by the experience of uh, care for others. Um, having a real uh, and strong ethic and ethos of care. Um, uh, so often people who are depressed, who are morally disengaged, the way that we enhance our resilience is not by holding back, but actually by giving. Mm. And in that way, there's a, a sense of purpose, of meaning, and also of efficacy, you know, that it, it matters uh, that um, we care about the world. It matters that we feel concerned. It matters that um, we engage in, in service to others. Mm -hmm. 
And then you mentioned community. I think that our dedication um, toward community, toward relationship, manifesting as uh, as respect, um, a commitment to engendering safety in in that community, in our community, um, and uh, the the sense of um, of warmth. His Holiness the Dalai Lama speaks about this. In Zen, we talk about warm hand to warm hand. Um, how, you know, uh, resilience is deeply enhanced through the medium of our relationship with each other, through the medium of community. Hmm. And then the final piece for me is compassion always. Um, you know, of that uh, compassion I say it's actually not a feeling. It is an emergent process that allow us to actually uh, perceive the truth of suffering and then to have this sense of commitment to um, what it is to be a, a benefit into a world that is um, pretty fraught today. Mm. So those are just some features of resilience that I, I wanted to mention. You know, it's good community, its nimbleness, its compassion, its moral character. Yeah. Mm, that was beautiful. Like this was such a lovely flow. It's so lovely to listen to you and, and, and flow with you through all these qualities that you transmit when you speak. I think that was a lovely plateau for, for adaptability, relationality and uh, community and resilience building. This was very concentrated uh, in the way you, you spoke about it. It's beautiful. Thank you. And, um, and so I see, I don't want to stress your time too much. I know you have a lot going on, so maybe we will wrap it up and say, I mean, some of it you said already, but you know, as your own experience, we are, interdependently interwoven in in the current climate situation and uh or in other situations like uh the war in 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 ukraine right now or the pandemic so we are we're experiencing this kind of interdependence this global interdependence and and so for me, for some of us, it feels like it sparks our creativity and we become even more creative and more enlivened by like through the contributions we make and, uh, and, and channel the energy into that. But for many people, it also feels like, you know, are we going to make it, uh, where will all of this go? And maybe you have some final words for people to, you know, to see, yes, it's, it's, it's sometimes heavy. It's sometimes hard on us. But uh, what you said before is like opening the gates into the giving is one option. And if there are any other thoughts you have for this time, so how we navigate through this time, that would be very lovely for our listeners. You know, my uh, wonderful teacher, the late uh, Glassman Roshi, he emphasized um, the power of sitting in the charnel ground. So whether it was Auschwitz, where we were in retreat, mm. or Rwanda, or sitting with the homeless, the unsheltered, or being with dying, or as my own work uh, in the penitentiary of New Mexico, uh, sitting with men on death row for six years, I think we live in a time when science is really validating what humans have known throughout the ages. And that is compassion, as His Holiness the Dalai Lama has said, it's not a luxury. It's a necessity for our well being and the well being of others, of beings everywhere. Mm. It enhances resilience, it enhances transcendence. And it also um, ensures a kind of survival. And it's, it's a call that, um, as I said, we cannot be attached to outcome. Uh, but we also, and we don't do it for a bodhisattva button. And we don't do it um, because there's social virtue in it. We do it because um, we are moved. This is what the heart tells us to do. Uh -huh. 
Um, and I feel that this is uh, an imperative for our time now. Mm, that's um, so good. Actualize this, these, this uh, yeah. experience of compassion uh, really from uh, the foundation of love and, and of joy. Mm. That's so beautiful. It's like there's not an in order to really feel it because we, we do it because we feel it in our hearts in the present moment. That's a beautiful sentence. Those of us who are going to be happy in this lifetime are those of us who serve. Being selfish is not the path to joy, mm. but being unselfish and really benefiting others, this is the, the path to joy. Yeah, wow, that's a beautiful ending for a wonderful conversation. It's an honor to talk to you, Roshi. You. And I really enjoyed our time and the, the resonance. And I, I really enjoyed the flow of your words. It's very beautiful and saturated by your wisdom and your life, a deep life experience. So thank you for letting us participate in it. And uh, thank you for joining the summit. It's a real contribution. Thank you so much. And... Uh, if you can any, do anything to support you, if you need anything, I'm very happy to be of service if uh, in your current situation. Yeah, I know it's... Well, thank you. I wish you uh, a, a wonderful summit and I'm sure it's going to benefit many people and I look forward to, you know, connecting again at some point. Yeah, me too. I'm looking forward to connecting again. Thank you so much and have a good journey and be blessed in everything that's happening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Point of Relation with Thomas Hubel. Stay connected and get updates about new episodes by visiting our website, pointofrelationpodcast.com, and by subscribing to the Thomas Hubel YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and share about us with your community on social media. Thank you. We appreciate your support.